we look at modern missiles, now so vital to national strength and survival, it is startling to remember that such a tremendous and revolutionary development is so recent, largely since World War II. But the beginnings were much earlier, during World War I. That was when the bug was planned, partly under the supervision of Orville Wright and a young officer who later became General Hap Arnold. The bug was a small pilotless airplane with a conventional engine and a built-in guidance system. It was intended to carry a TNT bomb, and though it was never used in combat, it was in fact a guided missile, our first. The development of the modern missile had to wait for the beginning of the right kind of propulsion. And this again was the work of an American, Dr. Robert H. Goddard. In 1926 in Massachusetts, he achieved the first firing of a liquid fuel rocket. It reached an altitude of only 184 feet. But it was the first demonstration of the techniques that later gave us long range missiles and the launchings of satellites and the sending of vehicles into space. Goddard was the father of modern rocketry, but it was a long time before the significance of his work was appreciated by his countrymen. During the 1930s, Goddard was in New Mexico, working largely by himself and without government support. In his research and experiments, he did not have military missiles in mind. His objective and his achievement was a propulsion system that could send rockets to high altitudes. It took years for the United States to get around to making military use of Goddard's ideas. So during World War II, the guided missiles used by our Army Air Forces were unpowered bomb carriers, launched from aircraft and controlled by radio. Another type was the Weary Willie, a dispensable conventional aircraft loaded with TNT. Without a pilot, it was guided to its target by radio control. Such weapons were valuable as a phase of development, but they were far from being missiles in the modern sense. really woke everybody up, including America, was the deadly use by the Germans of the V-1 and the V-2. In 1936, they had started their Pinamunde project to develop missiles of an entirely new type. In other words, they had been hard at it in a period when little official notice was given to modern military rocketry in the United States. Still, it was eight years before the Germans were ready to fire their new missiles and their first one was not a rocket. It was the buzz bomb, the V-1. Its propulsion was by pulse jet engine. The Germans fired more than 7,000 of them, of which more than 2,000 reached London, causing many thousands of casualties and vast damage. But the V-1 was slow a good target for anti-aircraft artillery or fighter planes. Nearly 4,000 of them were brought down. In September of that same year, 1944, the Germans also began their firings of the vastly superior V-2, which was powered by a real liquid fuel engine. Military rockets in a rudimentary form had been used for centuries, but their propulsion was by the use of gunpowder. In this new era, it was the Germans who realized that the liquid fuel rocket could be put to military use, that it could be given impressive range and great destructive power. 
Thus, the advent of the V-2 had great historical significance. For with it, modern military missiles entered a new phase. More than 1,100 fell on England. They not only took a toll of more than 9,000 casualties, they also had a devastating psychological effect. For unlike the buzz bomb, the V-2 fell without warning. It had a speed of 3,300 miles per hour, and it could not be intercepted by fighter aircraft or brought down by anti-aircraft artillery. The V-2 blasted open a new era. But the Germans have always admitted that they could not have brought off this achievement without the research and example of the American Goddard. At the end of World War II, captured V-2 missiles and components were brought to the United States. Good use was made of them at White Sands Proving Grounds in New Mexico. Reassembled and modified V-2s were tremendously valuable teaching tools in what was soon to become a vigorous American effort to enter the rocket missile age. Three, two, one, zero. In World War II, we had already used several types of small rocket-driven weapons. And in Korea, the Air Force again used such weapons launched from aircraft against targets either on the ground or in the air. And before long, we had others, including the Falcon, a vast, accurate, and powerful guided missile launched from our interceptor aircraft. The Genie, an unguided weapon, is the first air-to-air -air missile that carries a nuclear warhead. It too is launched from Air Force fighter aircraft. The Matador was the Air Force's first successful ground-to-ground -ground guided missile. It is boosted off by a rocket, and then a turbojet engine takes over. Electronically controlled by ground personnel, the Matador is a reliable tactical missile that can be armed with a nuclear warhead. The Mace is an improved version of the Matador, larger, faster, and of greater range. Our first answer to the need for a long-range strategic missile was the SNARK. Again, a jet pilotless aircraft started on its flight by rocket boosters. The SNARK was the world's first intercontinental missile. It had a range of about 5,000 miles. Pilotless interceptor, the Air Force Bomark, a guided missile launched from the ground and capable of destroying approaching hostile bombers hundreds of miles from our shores at very high altitudes. It gained much importance in plans for the defense of our borders. After the launching by a rocket, it is powered at supersonic speed by twin ramjet engines. Through the period of missile development in the 1950s, the concept of the mixed force was evolving. That is, we of course needed and for years would continue to need manned aircraft. Vastly improved bombers, capable of delivering nuclear weapons, became ready for use. The B-47, as a highly dependable modern medium bomber, and the B-52, as a fine long-range bomber, like the B-47, a source of the Strategic Air Command's great deterrent strength. For a considerable period, each of the two systems, manned aircraft and ballistic missiles, would have its own marked advantages. 
But while the successful use of bombers depends to some extent on tactics and countermeasures, a ballistic missile with its hypersonic speed can reach its target with small risk of interception by enemy aircraft. It was a most promising partner to the long-range bomber. So, in the 1950s, we embarked on one of the greatest crash programs in our history for the development of intermediate range and intercontinental ballistic missiles. With the Thor, the Air Force had its first intermediate range missile. It began a series of successful launchings in 1957 and was destined to win a place for itself in the arsenal of the free world. Besides being a good military missile, the Thor has been used with great success as a booster for satellites and space probes. The Air Force is rightly proud of the Thor. Test missiles were of immense value in the accelerated program for the development of an intercontinental missile. The X-10, though driven by turbojet engines, taught us much about aerodynamic design for missiles with supersonic speed and about automatic guidance. And the X-17, a three-stage test missile, revealed much needed information on nose cone design. It saved a lot of time and money in solving problems of re-entry at high speed and consequent high temperatures. In 1955, the highest national priority was given by order of the president to the development of the Atlas. Late in 1957, the Air Force achieved the first successful launching of this giant. Some months later, when the Atlas was fully tested, our country took on new confidence in its missile capability. The Atlas became a vital part of our military strength and other formidable missiles such as Titan and Minuteman, were in the research and testing stage. After the Korean conflict, the Cold War went right on. All along, it had been only too obvious that ever since World War II, the Soviets had been building their military strength. Their threat of world domination was real, and it was increasing all the time. expanded Air Force. 
Upon it depended the security of the U.S. and of the free world. Because the Soviet threat was worldwide, our air power had to have global range and be instantly ready to respond. In the decade of the 1950s, the Air Force gained this objective, an achievement that stands as one of the most remarkable in military history. Our means of facing up to the Soviet menace took various forms. For one thing, we retained our bases in the Pacific, such as this one on the island of Guam, which had served so well in World War II and during the Korean conflict. Here we see an example of another element of the new strength we gained in this period after the Korean War. Modern aircraft. This is our B-47, the jet medium range bomber that became the dependable workhorse of Strategic Air Command. The B-47 was the world's first operational jet bomber. Its six jet engines give it a speed of more than 600 miles per hour. It has a ceiling of over 40,000 feet and an unrefueled range of over 3,000 miles. The B-47 was an admirable modern replacement for the good old B-29. The Soviets, too, as we knew very well, were developing formidable modern military aircraft. They had good bombers. They had their MiGs and other excellent fighters. And they made a point of showing the world that they had a modern arsenal. There was plenty of strength in the threat that faced us. to Western Europe had resulted in 1949 in the formation of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The United States, as a leading member, contributed heavily to NATO's air power. In Britain, in Germany, and for other examples in France and in Turkey. In addition to NATO, the U.S. supplied air power to other parts of the world, the Far East, the Middle East, and the top of the world. Countering the threat of Soviet atomic power, on our side, we thoroughly established the function of the Strategic Air Command as our chief deterrent to attack from any quarter on the globe. In 1955, we had ready the B-52 Stratofortress, which we see here on snow-covered Loring Air Force Base in Maine, one of the far-flung system of SAC bases. is a true intercontinental bomber with an unrefueled range of more than 6,000 miles. It is a carrier of nuclear weapons and it can be equipped with formidable air-to-ground missiles. Here at Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska is where the Strategic Air Command's powerful round-the-clock readiness is controlled. Here is the command post for every SAC base for all of SAC's men all its aircraft and its missiles throughout the world. Here is the nerve center of a truly global striking force. It was in this decade of the 1950s that missiles were brought into the family of weapons of aerospace warfare. It 
was a revolutionary development that had the most profound effect on international relations, on the minds of men everywhere, on national objectives, and on military planning. For missiles made necessary a new concept of aerospace power, the mixed force. Manned aircraft, now so powerful and reliable, would still be indispensable. But now we needed the advantages of missiles too. And after long and hard effort, we had them. overseas installations, we had the Matador, a limited range missile that gave a new kind of capability to our tactical forces. Our British allies established bases for the use of the Thor, our own Air Force intermediate range ballistic missile. And from stateside installations, the Atlas, our first intercontinental ballistic missile, became ready for use under control of the Strategic Air Command. We had a complementary weapon to be used against any target which we could foresee in potentially hostile nations, no matter how far distant. Worldwide Air Force derives its strength from many sources. We had our missiles ready to deliver deadly counter blows upon any antagonist who dared to attack us. We had our modern bomber force poised at widely scattered bases to deliver a nuclear counter attack if war was forced upon us. fast and versatile fighter aircraft of our tactical forces, stationed at home and overseas, to bolster our readiness and flexibility. We had our many thousands of officers and airmen, many of them highly trained specialists in technical and scientific fields. We had hundreds of thousands of people in industrial plants who worked in support of air power. We had our wealth of electronic and mechanical devices to help our men and aircraft get the job done. And we had our pool of scientific know-how devoted to the direction and accomplishment of Air Force research. What does it all add up to? All of these elements have a single goal, to keep the United States all powerful in the air. The great and central objective of preserving peace by deterring those who might plan to dominate us and by being strong enough to win any war that might be forced upon us. <laughs> 